Watson famously said when he took the mushrooms for the first time to to try to, you know, this was a fiercely articulate and eloquent um, um, speaker and writer. And yet he said, words fail me. It's like trying to explain to a blind man what it is like to see. <laughs> This is the Psychedelic Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, David Flores, and today I have the very distinct pleasure of being joined by two very distinct gentlemen here. We have Wade Davis, a well-known world traveler, and uh, Donald Curry, who is the clinical director um, for the new uh, Ascend Plus program at Dimensions Retreats, and you can find Dimensions Retreats at dimensionsretreats.com. We'll make sure we get the website linked into this podcast as well, and for folks new to Dimensions, uh, they are a Canadian company offering retreat experiences for personal growth, well-being, and creative exploration. Now, last month, it was announced, Wade, that uh, you were going to be joining uh, the Dimensions team here as a guest speaker. Uh, you know, I think folks out there would be hard-pressed to find someone uh, who has traveled the world more than you have. Of course, you know, your time with National Geographic, that afforded you the opportunity to travel the world and immerse yourself in cultures and communities all across the globe. And, you know, I want to start and kick this conversation off, you know, by helping our audience understand why you've chosen to become involved here uh, with Dimensions. And there was a statement that uh, you made in a previous interview that I really want to highlight here because I think it does a great job of kicking things off. You mentioned that one of the pleasures of travel was the opportunity to live amongst people who have not forgotten the old ways. I think that's a fantastic statement here, and, and I want to utilize that as an opportunity to help folks out there understand how your background and your experience as a world traveler has led you to where you are here today and why you've chosen to become involved here with Dimensions. Well, thanks, David and, and, and Donald. It's great being with both of you. You know, it, it's interesting. This history of psychedelics um, is, is rich and deep, but it, but it's it, it it's curious, you know. There's been this extraordinary resurgence, which which none of us, I think, of my age would have anticipated even 40 years ago. I mean, for example, when I first take, took Yahé or Ayahuasca uh, with the Kamsa in the upper reaches of the Putumayo in 1974, if you had asked me what uh, which of all the sacred medicines was going to sweep the world, I can promise you Ayahuasca would have been at the bottom of the list. I mean, things change. And my my particular background and why I'm excited about helping out at Dimensions is that, you know, it's not as much that I was a world traveler, but uh, my, 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 my education is rooted in two extraordinary traditions, uh, both of which related to the plight of cultural and biological diversity on the planet. And as a very much an activist anthropologist, you know, my mission is really to celebrate the fact that the world in which you were born is just one model of reality. And the other peoples of the world, the other cultures of the world, aren't failed attempts at being you, let alone failed attempts at being modern. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What, what does it mean to be human and alive? And together, the different visions of life represent our collective repertoire for dealing with the challenges that confront us. Uh, and will confront us over the coming decades. And that incredible diversity of vision embodied in culture is far more imperiled than, in fact, is the even the uh, biological integrity of the biosphere er eroding as it may be. I mean, of the 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born, uh, David, today half aren't being taught to children. So literally at risk is half of humanity's uh, emotional, psychological, intellectual um, uh, echo, uh, knowledge. And and this is something that I've tried to address uh, all of my career. But the other pillar of my, my training was in the shadow of the legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evan Schultes, who was the man who sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the so-called magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. I mean, this was a man who as a young youth who had never been west of the Charles River in Boston, too poor to attend the dormitories at Harvard College, at the age of 18 or 19, took a Studebaker across the dusty roads of America 
and spent eight weeks with the roadman of the Kiowa ingesting peyote four nights a week. And he came back a man transformed. And Schultes was part of that very small cadre. And it's interesting to, to remember that long before the kind of the, the pop frenzy precipitated by Tim Leary um, and the explosion of interest in psychedelics in the 60s, there was this incredibly eclectic cadre, Gordon Wasson, the banker, uh, Weston Labar, the Freudian anthropologist, Schultes, the botanist, um, Albert Hoffman doing his work in uh, for Sandoz on the um, on the uh, derivatives of, of ergot, which led to the discovery of LSD. And, and, and these characters were not taking these substances in any kind of context that gave any meaning to their experience. It was completely and absolutely new. And one of the things that, of course, came out of that research, um, codified by people like Andrew Weil, an acolyte of Schultes, was the importance of set and setting. You know, the set you bring to an experience, a setting in which you take the substance. And it's fascinating to imagine what it was like for these individuals when there was no established set or setting. You know, Wasson famously said when he took the mushrooms for the first time to, to try to, you know, this was a fiercely articulate and eloquent um, um, speaker and writer. And yet he said, words fail me. It's like trying to explain to a blind man what it is like to see. And so I sort of come very much out of that early tradition I mean, Schultes was my mentor and my mm -hmm. father figure for 18 years. And and at that time, you have to remember, too, that the Amazon was a long way away. I remember in 74, David and Don, when I first went off to the Amazon, I would say to my friends at Harvard, I might as well say I'm going to the moon. You know, I mean, nobody had ever heard of ayahuasca, you know, and the last thing Schultes said to me before I went off at the age of 19 to the Amazon, where I would stay for 15 months uh, he said, "Don't come back without trying ayahuasca," and so this was a kind of a kind of a kernel of a cadre, and those people were my mentors. And and what I often say about psychedelics um, is, is that when we look back on the sea change, um, cultural sea change in the West in the 1960s, um, which is extraordinary, women going from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the white house gay men and women from the closet to the altar you know the environment we we you know we we didn't i mean get, getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was an environmental victory when i was a kid nobody spoke about the biosphere and yet now when we look back on that sea change until very recently the one critical ingredient that we've expunged from the record is that millions of us they prostrate before the gates of awe, having taken a psychedelic. And I always say, uh, you know, and like our beloved ex-president, Mr. Clinton, um, not only did I take psychedelics, um, my life was transformed by them. I wouldn't write the way I write. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't treat nature. I wouldn't treat women. I wouldn't treat men of different sexual orientation. I mean, I everything. In, in in fact, as our parents would always say to us, you know, don't take these things, you'll never come back the same. And our poor parents didn't understand that was the entire point. Yeah. Now, Donald, you are the clinical director at uh, Dimensions Algonquin Highlands. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the framework that you've put into, you know, um, this new Ascend Plus program. Talk to us a little bit about what folks can expect from the moment they sign up um, through the experience itself, also post experience, and also share a little bit about what you hope uh, Wade is going to be able to bring in terms of, you know, his experience and, uh, you know, how you hope that that's going to enhance this program here. Absolutely. So great to be with you both uh, today, David and, and Wade, and super excited that Wade is going to be joining us up, up here. Uh, um, there's so much excitement that, uh, that is is starting to happen with with people calling in and and wanting to join us for this retreat experience. Uh, the most important uh, part of the dimensions experience is safety, psychological and physical safety for our guests. So from the moment that people sign up for our program, they're they're guided through an intake process with our intake coordinators and our psychotherapists, and we do uh, assessments. 
uh, both psychological and and medical assessments to make sure that that this meta these medicines are going to be safe for people uh, to take and that there's no contraindications. And we also look at the different uh, areas that someone is looking to work on uh, in a in a retreat. We have two different retreat paths. We have our Ascend and our Ascend Plus uh, program, which is for self betterment. Uh, and that's where there's there's no clinical indications that are present. Uh, and then we have our Elevate program. And for Elevate, that is where uh, uh, that program we address uh, mental health concerns such as depression, anxiety, and and PTSD. Uh, so you know, Wade was talking about about set and setting, uh, which is so important in the psychedelic experience. We know more and more that the psychedelic experience is actually cued by the environment that we take these uh, these medicines in. And so we really start to work with helping people to cultivate the right mindset going into these experiences through uh, preparation with our psychotherapists, through group therapy, and also through psychoeducation uh, around trauma and, and what gets stored in the body, what we're carrying with us into these experiences. Because oftentimes those traumas do show up in, in uh, a plant medicine journey. So it's very important that we set that context uh, with people prior. Um, the other aspect as well is, is educating people on, on these plant medicines and the different effects that they can have so that they have an awareness of, of what the experience might be for them going in. Uh, when people arrive, uh, we take them through uh, two days of preparation prior to their plant medicine experience. And we braid together all of these practices that are backed by modern neuroscience, things like Qigong, yoga, uh, meditation, uh, somatic psychotherapy. Uh, we have a flow tank, which is a great uh, tool for preparation and helping people to downregulate the nervous system. Uh, we have nature therapy. We take people out on, on nature walks so that they can connect with uh, uh, the nature and the forest. Uh, and being in nature down regulates the nervous system and it helps to combat all of the modern stress that we have uh, due to urban living. Uh, so, so we're really doing a lot of work on the front end, helping people to prepare for uh, their plant medicine experience with, with cannabis. Uh, and, then, and then we have the, the ceremonial experience and we actually work with what we call plant elders. And plant elders are individuals that come from a tradition that they've, they've trained in. Uh, and right now we work with uh, someone that comes from the vegetalismo tradition in Peru. Uh, and so the, the actual ceremonial experience is led by psychotherapists who offer psychological support, as well as a plant elder that, uh, that brings in these, uh, these ancient practices into the, the plant medicine ceremony. Now, when speaking of these ancient practices, uh, you know, as Dimensions really strives to become the gold standard for retreat centers here that offer, whether it's psychedelic assisted uh, therapy or, you know, other plant-based um, therapies such as cannabis, how are you going about integrating, you know, these practices that, of course, have been around for centuries and discovered by indigenous cultures and communities centuries ago? How are you ensuring that you are continuing to honor and pay respect to those by integrating this into a setting that obviously, you know, is is becoming somewhat, you know, standardized? Um, so I'm just curious to understand what practices Dimensions is putting forth here to ensure me, that the indigenous, you know, uh, cultures are not being uh, forgotten here. Let, let me jump in on that because um, one of the things that drew me to Dimensions was the seriousness of their intent, the very sophistication of the protocols uh, that um, uh, Donald has just outlined. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, at the heart of your question, David, is the issue of cultural appropriation. You know, are we just sort of, you know, dressing up, importing indigenous people from Peru and 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 putting on a show? I, I mean, I said it rhetorically, and the answer, of course, is no. And and it's important to remember that, you know, we have this kind of conceit about the fragility of indigenous people as if they're kind of you know, you know delicate and frail when they're anything but 
the case. And, and, and what's more, these, these traditions themselves are and have always been dynamic uh, in the heartland of South America. I mean, the way, for example, that yahe is used by the uh, by the Barasana, the Macuna, in, in the far reaches of the Valpes in Colombia, uh, as a quintessentially collective experience in which the entire male community uh, embarks on a series of literal and metaphorical journeys over a period of days to reassert their uh, responsibilities uh, and obligations to maintain the harmonic balances of the world as they see it, that's a far cry from what's going on in the small communities of the upper Putumayo, where individual curanderos in a kind of syncretic practice that infuses um, both Catholic uh, ideas and, and motifs with pre-Columbian ideas to service a, a, a modern community of campesinos coming to the curanderos for any number of ailments from uh, economic challenges to failed uh, uh, businesses to 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 love uh, challenges. You know, th these practices are dynamic and ever changing. And the very fact that ayahuasca, for example, is now sweeping the world, speaks not to the fragility of the indigenous people whose genius uh, led to the discovery of this remarkable medicine, but rather, as my good friend Dennis McKenna says, to the power of the plant itself. And the fact maybe it's just the plant that's driving this equation and not people. And, and, and that just might be a good thing, as Dennis always says. You know, these powerful medicines, and it's nice that we call them medicines, um, you know, they have, as Andy Weil always said, a completely ambivalent potential for good or bad, uh, you know, uh, uh, and they just, they just sort of... Um, Become a template upon which cultural and personal beliefs can, can, can and work their way out, and that's why this notion of set and setting is so important. Um, but these substances, in the proper context, um, they're not panaceas, mm -hmm. and the use of them is by no means trivial, and it's not for everybody, as 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 Donald said. Uh, you can't expect them to be as efficacious as they are if they were in fact pharmacologically benign. They're not, they're powerful. But, you know, for certain, and, and but for certain things, you just know how effective they can be. End of life care, coming not to cease fearing death, but to come to terms with it. Or for personal crises, emotional uh, trauma, uh, post-traumatic stress. I mean, these substances can be absolutely catalytic and, and work in 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 minutes what therapy would uh, require years to achieve, but you've also um, got perhaps the most important healing journey of all, which is why it's so interesting that Dimensions uh, explicitly integrates nature walks with the experience with these medicines because the ultimate healing that we all have to do surely is with the natural world. And it is impossible to take San Pedro cactus, for example, the entheogen that's been used since at least 3,000 years before the Christian era by virtually every major um, culture in Andean South America. You cannot take San Pedro um, without coming to a deeper appreciation of the natural world. And that surely is a healing that we must do. And again, that's what we can learn from indigenous people in the sense that we, in our extractive model, in our having since the time of Descartes, deanimated the world, reduced the world to a stage upon which only the human drama unfolds. We think of that as the norm and the triumph of secular materialism has become the conceit of modernity, but it's not the norm, it's highly anomalous. Almost all cultures in the world base their relationship with the natural world on reciprocity. Some basic iteration of the idea that the earth owes people its bounty, people in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. And now that's a message that is almost inherent in the experience of these sacred medicines. And so this is why the kind of holistic approach 
that Dimensions has pioneered is so intriguing. It really is and will be a center of healing, a, a, a refuge for those um, seeking to realign not just their physical bodies, but also their 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 psychological and uh, spiritual side of their beings. Yeah, and Donald, would you like to uh, elaborate a little bit more on dimensions and and stance on you know indigenous reciprocity? Absolutely. First of all, we've uh, something that we've done is really work to build relationship with the local indigenous communities here, and four uh, percent of our our total revenue goes back to the Indigenous communities, helping them to, to build and to heal and to grow. And we really uh, look at uh, pan-cultural uh, uh, practices, right? There's certain ceremonial practices that are across all cultures. And, and if someone is, is bringing in something from a specific lineage, it's something that they have trained in. It's something that they have permission to use right? And that has been passed down to them. If we look at every culture has their their own ceremonial practices as well. And so if it, a practitioner looks into their own personal lineage, they can connect with certain ceremonial practices that come from their peoples, right? And, and as a humanity, we all come from different cultures, and it's a part of this process as well as understanding, you know, what is my culture as a practitioner? What ceremonial practices are, are, are coming from my culture and how can I weave that in to the process? So we really look at respecting the lineages and getting those lineages involved in our, in our program. Uh, and as we expand out into other countries, we're looking at working with uh, specific indigenous medicine keepers that come from those lineages. Remember too that ritual is not inherently sacrosanct. You know, ritual is only uh, the means to make manifest the sacred in the material world. And so it's not the shaking of the feathers that matters. It's what is evoked and invoked by the shaking of the feathers. So you know, I don't think you want to get too hung up on the artifice. And if there are certain protocols that any uh, culture deems to be in some way private, well, that's up to them to to um, limit the exposure of those ideas. And they will. You know, I mean, there, I, there, there, I, there's something, you know, I, I've spent, um, you know, all my life since I was 14 years old living among other cultures um, all over the world. And I've never been with one that didn't impress me as being incredibly strong, proud, uh, you know, confident and, 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 and capable. And we have this sort of uh, notion, I think it's actually a kind of a lingering colonial notion, it's very patronizing um, of, of, of that these societies are somehow inherently fragile and frail, you know, quaint and colorful, but destined to fade away. Nothing could be further from the truth. The, the reality is that these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable, for, identifiable forces. And that's an optimistic observation, because if we recognize that, um, that, that human beings are the cause of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. But this is not something where these individuals, as if like a, some kind of, you know, sauvage species are slipping away. No, these are powerful people and we have to acknowledge their agency. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, these are fantastic points. And I, I appreciate the the candor, you know, and being able to just kind of speak about this quite openly here. Uh, I, I want to circle back to a statement that was made earlier about uh, the fact that you know, psychedelics are not for everyone, and they're not a panacea. Um, Donald, I mean, give us an understanding of, you know, what goes into um, the process by which, you know, someone signing up, you know, for a retreat, uh, th I'm sure there's somebody listening to this podcast right now, uh, we'll call her Jane Doe. She's in her 50s, um, perhaps struggling from treatment resistant depression. Perhaps she's interested in thinking that maybe this is an opportunity for her to experience a breakthrough. Is it? Is it though? I mean, what what goes into the 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 process of uh, you know approving people to come into these retreats? Is it just anybody? Uh, kind of just paint a little picture there if you can for us. 
Yeah, and 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 it's not just anyone, right? Like we really do a lot of work with people to understand where they are right now and and what the current symptoms are that they're experiencing. Uh, so basically with our assessment process, we we screen for uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and symptoms of PTSD. Uh, but we're also looking for, right now, we're not working with, with personality disorders. There hasn't been a lot of research that's been done on psychedelics with personality disorders. There is some research that has been done and more will probably be done in the future. Uh, but at this point in time, we're really looking at, okay, this is a this is a population where there hasn't been enough research yet to see how these medicines are going to affect. So right now, we're working with uh, people with PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Um, uh, people who haven't had these experiences before, there might be a lot of fear around it as well. So there may be psychotherapy that they need to do to develop more of a self-understanding before engaging in these practices. So we really get an understanding of each person as an individual. And then if, if it's our retreat is right for them at this time, then you know they would get an approval. If not, we would give them different resources or different things to do in the meantime, and then come back and reassess with us in six months or a year. Fantastic. Uh, Wade, I mean, what, what are you hoping to experience here, you know, uh, here with your involvement with the Ascend Plus program? Well, I'm just for me, it's it, it, it's an, ex, an experiment as well. You know, I mean, I'm just really intrigued by the seriousness of of the protocols and uh, um, and and I'm keen to see how this is working out in people's lives in real time. I mean, there's been so much um, uh, excitement recently and enormous amounts of investment in the psychedelic space. And um, you know, it's 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 clearly, um, so, you know, something that was put on hold, regrettably, in the hysteria of the first years of the war on drugs. You know, I mean, one of the reasons that the government came down so hard on psychedelics is that they are inherently subversive and. Uh, um and and uh, you know nixon not only wanted to win in 1972 by cleaving off his so-called um you know uh, uh silent majority uh, and he turned on the war on drugs sp specifically to do that we know from the memoirs of his domestic policy advisor ehrlichman that he had no interest or concern about drugs whatsoever but the bottom line is that um um, the the potential of these substances um, never had a chance to be realized. Um, and I'm very interested, um, uh, particularly in some of the traditional South American um, entheogens, as to how this potential will be realized, you know, and 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 again, it's it's um it it it, it uh uh it, it we it's waiting to be seen but it, i i feel that it, it has enormous uh potential for well-being um and uh th that's why i was drawn to you know participate in this first um session if only as a speaker sharing a few thoughts putting this whole thing in perspective um um in the lineage that I referred to earlier, going back to Wasson and Hoffman and and Schultes and Alex Shulgin and all these wonderful characters that I was lucky enough to know. And Wade, I'm I'm curious from your perspective. Um, you know, is society ready to rediscover some of these old ways? I mean, we've become a society right now that. We're almost drowning in technology. You know, we've got uh, phones in front of us every day, computers, televisions. Um, are, are is society ready to to really, you know, take that leap forward and start rediscovering some of these these old traditional modalities? Well, I don't think it's we'll rediscover or reinvent old modalities, but I think I think that if we don't begin, and I think we're in the process of moving in that direction. Um, uh, if we don't begin to redefine our relationship to the natural world, I think we'll continue on a downward slope. I mean, you know, this this is where, to me, the 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 value 
of the portraits that we can bring back of cultures around the world and how they think and how they operate. Um, it's, it's not to suggest that our contemporary society somehow go back to a pre-industrial past or that any people anywhere in the world be kept from the brilliant products of that modern society, be it those cell phones you mentioned or allopathic medicine or, or just technology in general. It's rather to say that the very existence of all these other ways of thinking about our relationship to the natural world, um, the very existence puts to the lie those of us in our own culture who say that we cannot change when we all know we must change the fundamental way in which we inhabit this planet. Um, you know, whether that's going to happen or not is, 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 the, is the great art of history that we can anticipate. Uh, but, you know, it's like my father always said, he wasn't a religious man, but he believed deeply in good and evil. And uh, he had no illusions that evil would ever be vanquished from the earth. But he would say to you, you know, son, take your side and get on with it. In other words, you you have to make a decision whether you're going to try to push the wheel of what we might say, you know, justice or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Are we going to put our shoulder to that wheel or are we going to let ourselves be pushed down the hill by um, its opposition? And I think if you if you think of life in that way, it's a little bit like the Buddhist pilgrim. You know, the goal is not a destination, a state of mind. You don't expect to vanquish evil, um, although you do her, her hope that, as Martin Luther King said, the arc of history does ultimately bend toward the righteous. But the bottom line is 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 that when you don't expect to win, um, uh, you, you never give up. It's a little bit like, you know, we have this thing in the Christian tradition that we think that somehow good, good is going to vanquish evil. It ain't going to happen. And, you know, when Lord Krishna was asked the obvious question, um, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe? Uh, Lord Krishna um, said to thicken the plot. You know, in other words, we have this, this is the world we live in. And I can't help but think that these medicines um, are here uh, to help us uh, move forward. Yeah. Um, something else, we've had 220 people through our program here at Algonquin Highlands, and there's this return to a sense of community that I think is really healing for people as well. You know, when we live our daily lives in, in urban centers and cities, we can live on our phones and, and be so engaged in technology and live in this state of, of, of stress and fight and flight all the time. And there's something about returning to a sense of community that can be really healing for people. And a lot of the work that we do here is based on polyvagal theory. And, and when our vagus nerve, which is responsible for our rest and digest response, is activated, that's actually where our social engagement system is also activated, where we're able to connect to each other in, in more heart-centered, present ways. And so there's something about returning to a sense of community as well that is very healing for people. Being seen and witnessed by, by caring others uh, can be a very integral part of the healing ex experience. And in that healing experience, Donald, you know, I mean, what role ultimately does you know, plant-based medicines, whether it's psychedelics or cannabis, what role does it play? I mean, no, understanding that it's not the silver bullet, it's not the the end all be all cure for it, but what role specifically does it play in helping to pe helping people reconnect with themselves, reconnect with community, reconnect with mother nature? Yeah. Um, psychedelics are just a catalyst for change. That's all that they are. Um, you know, we believe that's why we believe in, in really coupling it with psychotherapy and all of these mind body practices, as well as the group therapy, um, uh, ceremony when we're in ceremony and someone takes the psychedelic temporarily parks, the conscious mind, the rational thinking mind, it allows people to have greater access to the unconscious material maybe emotions or traumas that have been stored in the physical body. And it helps us to clear that out so that we can once again reconnect to our essence, right? There's that state of oceanic boundlessness that is talked about in psilocybin and, and cannabis research now is showing 
that the same state of oceanic boundlessness can be experienced in a therapeutic setting with the right psychological support. There's this connection to the fact that we are part of something that is bigger than ourselves. We are part of a system, right? Communities, this planet, uh, this universe. And it's, it's recognizing that everything is all interwoven and interconnected. And once we start to recognize that, we start to live life differently. There's been a lot of research now showing that in communities where psilocybin is used, crime rates go down because people start to recognize when I harm another, I am harming a piece of myself, right? So, so psychedelics are just the catalyst that can get, get us to that place of understanding. Um, but it is the psychotherapy and the integration that, that then help us to live more in that, that heart-centered space on a day-to-day -day basis. You, you know, it, it's very analogous to the ancient um, practice of, of pilgrimage. You know, the, the whole notion of the pilgrim is someone who leaves the, the uh, constructed social environment, moves through sacred geography, entering a liminal space um, where things can happen. And eventually then reaching a destination and becoming reintegrated into the social space. Well, that movie through geography is in a way what happens through consciousness when you take a psychedelic. You know, you 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 suddenly are taken out of your body, uh, you're putting into another realm, and eventually you reintegrate into this world again. And and that and that in that lies, I think, the great potential of it. And there are lots of ways to um to use these substances you know uh, um you know uh, richard albert tim leary's great partner at harvard famously said you know get the message and hang up as george harrison did a lot of people find that you know one or two psychedelic experiences opened the door to a kind of spiritual realm they had never been able to imagine a realm that they then spend their lives trying to explore and understand without the use of any psychoactive substances whereas other people find that a periodic a reminder or or, or a, a a kind of a wink of the cosmos that comes to you from a little experience uh, helps them on their way so there's all kinds of um uh, ways of using these substances i for example am very much i suppose in the richard albert camp you know i i uh, when I was young, I um, I was very disciplined in not using the psychedelics until a certain age, even though I knew all about them. But once I g reached the ripe old age of 18, which I was my cutoff, I jumped in with both feet and, and found myself at Harvard, you know, in this extraordinary cadre. And as Professor Schultes used to say Tim Plowman and I ate our way through South America. We discovered any number of new um, hallucinogens. Andy Weil and I were the first people, scholars, to write about the Sonoran toad and revealing that um, extraordinary, uh, you know, uh, probably the most powerful psychoactive agent known from nature. Um, but that said, I personally found that... Um, Psychedelics were extraordinarily useful uh, when I wanted to deconstruct the world that had been imposed upon me by my birth. But then as Donald, I began to assemble a new world, a new career, a family, entering the householder phase. In a way, the last thing I wanted was to have that new world shattered or challenged in any way. So I actually stopped using any of these substances once I kind of entered that phase of my life, not in judgment, but simply because um, it seemed appropriate. And then as I got older and, and began to explore more deeply some of these traditions in the Amazon in particular, I began to use some of these substances, not really by desire, but by, in a sense, cultural obligation as I was hanging out with the Barasan and the Makuna, the Taimoko, and all the peoples of the Anaconda of the Northwest Amazon, or indeed, working with the healers of Huancabamba in the northern Andes of, of Peru. But again, we should stress that these substances um, are just vehicles, in a way, uh, to the divine. You know, it, it's interesting. One of the things we haven't talked about 
is a very curious botanical anomaly that of the roughly 120, 110 uh, plant, uh, uh, psycho, psychoactive substances known from nature, only one of which comes from an animal, 95% um, of them are from the Americas, uh, not because the forests of West Africa or equatorial uh, Southeast Asia are depauperate, or that the people there didn't ex explore, explore those forests for, for dynamic uh, biodynamic plants. Uh, the manipulation of poisons in West Africa is the most ubiquitous trade in material culture. But the reason they didn't discover a great number of hallucinogens is, is, is simply because they had other avenues to the divine. So again, these substances are, are uh, you know, are, 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 are just part of an overall kind of toolkit that humanity has discovered uh, since the dawn of time uh, to, 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 to invoke some technique of ecstasy to allow one to escape the mundane and soar away on the wings of trance to reach sort of metaphysical realms of wonder. This is something we find, this fundamental quest. It's so ubiquitous in the human, uh, the ethnographic record that you have to see it as part of the basic appetite of humanity. So before we, we head out here, um, Donald, I'm going to pose uh, one last question uh, here to you. And, you know, we, the way I kind of explain it to folks out there, when you're going into a psychedelic journey, it's almost like you're leaving the conscious mind. Think of it like a vehicle. You're going to leave it with a valet. Uh, you always want to make sure that it's in good hands. Um, for our listeners out there that are interested here in dimensions that are interested in the Ascend program, Obviously, you know, trust is very important and showing that they're in a safe and responsible environment is incredibly important. So why don't you just highlight one last time here again for us, you know, the the steps that Dimensions are taking to ensure safety and responsibility and to ensure that everyone, you know, is in good hands and that they're leaving their keys or their vehicle, if you will, uh, in good hands. Exactly. Thank you so much for that question. It's a very, uh, very good question. And, and with our protocols the first is the psychological safety right and medical safety ensuring that someone when they're going through intake that this this process is is going to be a good fit for for them uh and from the time that they're on site they're supported psychologically right there's psychotherapists that they can talk to and it's also everything that we do is based on informed consent right we take a very trauma informed approach to the delivery of, of these uh, ceremonial experiences. So it's ensuring that we educate people, we let them know what's going to happen and we get them involved. People have agency, right? Throughout the process and telling us, yeah, that feels right or that doesn't feel right. Um, so informed consent, really educating people on, on the experience from end to end and, and in actively engaging them in the process as well. Most definitely. Well, uh, Dimensions Algonquin Highlands is uh, scheduled to open to the public on May 18th, 2023. I encourage all of our listeners to uh, reach out. And again, the website is dimensionsretreats.com. Uh, Wade Davis, Donald Curry, thank you so much to both of you for your time. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward um, to catching up with you again after uh, the launch here of Ascend. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. And thanks for taking this time to meet with us today. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 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 uh.